it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the moderator tonight, who is our first sabbatical fellow, David McPherson. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks everyone for coming out this evening uh, to uh, see my friend James Mumford, who's come all the way across the pond from London. Uh, we poached him from a, a Notre Dame ethics and culture conference, and so it was fortuitous. So um, James is a British author and journalist. He currently lives in London, as I mentioned, but has spent many years in America, especially uh, and most recently in Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. He is the author of a book, Vexed, which I think he'll, he'll show you, uh, Vexed Ethics Beyond Political Tribes, uh, which was published with Bloomsbury UK and US in 2020. He's also the author of the book uh, with Oxford University Press called um, Ethics at the Beginning of Life, a Phenomenological Critique. Uh, James uh, is a public intellectual. He's written in a number of different venues, uh, including uh, The Guardian, The Statesman, Times Literary Supplement, The Spectator, The Atlantic, The Daily Telegraph, Unheard, Standpoint, The American Conservative, and The Hedgehog Review. From 2013 to 2017, uh, he taught, he worked and taught at the University of Virginia, where he remains a fellow in, at the Institute for Advanced Cultural Studies. Uh, he was an undergraduate at Oxford University, uh, a Henry Fellow at Yale University, and received his DPhil back at Oxford in 2011. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to James Mumford, who's going to talk to us about the challenges of talking about ethics in the age of political tribalism. All right. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for coming out this evening. Um, and thank you for those of you um, attending on Zoom. Um, it's a real uh, pleasure and uh, privilege to be um, here at the um, at University of Colorado Boulder. And um, uh, <clears throat> I, I live in London, but uh, both of my daughters are American citizens because uh, uh, we, I was living in Charlottesville, Virginia, and teaching at the University of Virginia uh, when they were born. And your country is very generous in um, giving, um, not, not something that happens in the UK, actually, um, giving automatic citizenship to, to those born in, um, on, your, on your shore, in your, in your shores. So, um, yeah, and I've lived in the States a number of times um, in LA as a child um, in Ohio before I went to college and then I went to Yale. Um, and, uh, and then at UVA. So I've had some wonderful times um, in the States. Um, uh, I should probably begin the talk by saying, to quoting Marlon Brando and the Godfather saying that I believe in America, um, the land of free refills, um, which is a particularly wonderful thing I've always found about America. Um, the country where people think, can, can think, often think too highly of the British. Um, and I've always, you know, Oh, it's gone down well in America. <laughs> and you get home and as, as Larkin said, here, no elsewhere, underwrites my existence. And there isn't, anyway. Um, and, uh, but it's also a country where in soccer, my solid tackles are misconstrued as fouls, I found, uh, playing <laughs> soccer in, in various leagues in Charlottesville. And where words like uh, boy and, and niche receive, receive strange pronunciations like is it buoy and niche um, which I so you know two great nations divided by a common time or whatever um, there are many things about America that fascinate me um, the one that um, and so I should say that this book vexed um, I wrote while I was at the University of Virginia so it was a response to um, what I saw of political tribalism in the U.S. context um, as well as in the UK context. And there are differences, but and we can talk about some of those this evening. But the polarization um, that I saw when I lived there from 2013 to 2017, and uh, so I was there for the 2016 election. Uh, we left actually just a few months before the neo-Nazi invasion of Charlottesville on August the 12th, 2017, but knew that knew that something could have, we were told something could happen, so we, we were, you know, we weren't we weren't you know expecting just just the sort of level of horror that, that they that they experienced that day, but we were told that uh, 
um, that there, there would be this protest. So, so that was, you know, very sad being, being in the UK and loving Charlottesville so much and it being, you know, praying for it in our churches and so forth and praying for Charlottesville and it getting on the map because of, for this awful reason was, was a very sad thing. Um, but yeah, I wrote this, I wrote this book um, because of the experience of political polarization. And uh, there are many things about American culture which fascinate me. And one of those is bumper stickers. And I've got some, some pictures of bumper stickers on the front of the book. But, you know, I always found it interesting how you, you pull up at a, at a traffic light, traffic, st what do they call it? Traffic stop? Oh, yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna translate, uh, my translator for the evening. Um, you pull up at a traffic stop and you see two cars on either side of you plastered with bumper stickers. On one is displayed pro-life, uh, pro-God, pro-guns, pro-life, and um, liberals take and spend, conservatives serve and protect. And then on the car, on the other side of you, it says there's stickers which say coexist, no nukes, and buy fresh, buy local. And what intrigues me about this phenomenon, um, being in the States, uh, we don't have it in quite the same way in the UK, um, is not simply people's willingness to parade their values so publicly, um, what is interesting to me is the way that different ethical values get grouped together and distributed on either side of the political spectrum. And that's what the book is about, really. Um, when I was in UVA, I was overwhelmed by the political tribalism that I saw. Um, I saw in, in uh, families and churches bitterly divided um, by the 2016 election. I saw university faculties which had which ostracized um, professors who are the other side of the political aisle and dinner parties where there were simply no debates because no one from the other side of the political spectrum had been invited. Um, but so I then went home in 2017, hoping for some reprieve from the culture wars um, and, but had none of it because Brexit really unleashed this um, same sorts of dynamics in the UK. Um, or families and relationships really strained by this seismic political event and the way that it was bound up with class and the way that it was bound up with other issues um, was absolutely fascinating. So there was no reprieve uh, when, I got, when I got back. But what also intrigues me about, oh, I'll just get my water, sorry. What also intrigues me about polarization is how it affects such a wide range of issues. So even the most personal moral issues um, get enveloped by ideology. The ideologies of, of, to, of to name two, of, 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 of the left and the right, and you know, I, I'm aware that there's obviously distinctions and those uh, defined and understood differently, both sides of the Atlantic and libertarianism is different from left liberalism and so forth. And we can talk some more maybe in the questions about some of those differences. But, but these, these ideologies are supposed to govern how we think not just about domestic policy issues, the level of the national debt or the severity of COVID restrictions mm -hmm. or, or foreign policy withdrawing from Afghanistan or boycotting China because of the Uyghur massacre, which is a huge issue at home and the genocide uh, in, uh, of that people group. Um, but the ideologies are supposed to govern all the weightiest moral controversies. That's what I was, I'm interested in in the book. The way they govern how we think about birth and death, growing up, and growing old, sex and gender, what I do with my wallet and what I do with my body. Our positions on the most controversial and personal existential questions have got bundled into what I call these package deals and then distributed on either side of the spectrum, and I have to choose between them, these package deals. Certain sets of positions are associated with certain political tribes. So for example, perhaps you, you know one is an environmentalist and supports affirmative action. And the temptation is that you simply inherit a view that say it's transphobic to question giving hormone blockers to children or you're an advocate of family values and you think that identity politics rips apart the body politic. And the temptation is that you inherit or you automatically accept that we should be tough on crime in, in all kinds of ways. 
So these are the package deals that I'm, I'm really talking about in the book. And in their quest for power, politicians pander to different interests and build coalitions, and I get that. But what I object to is when these package deals are sort of foisted upon me. What I object to is when politicians paper over the differences and pretend that this amalgam of views creates a unified, coherent whole. And what vexes me in the book is the sort of ideological amnesia, the deliberate attempt to make us forget that our intellectual settlement is a direct result of cut and paste. Now, why would anyone, given what I've said, be attracted to or tribalism? Why, why are people tribes? Um, G.K. Chesterton, the um, English humorist of another generation um, and Catholic writer said that you haven't understood a heresy until you felt the pull of it, which I quite like. And so what's the pull of tribalism? Well, for me, the reason it's sometimes difficult to rest free of package deals is because of I'm dying to belong and I want mates. Uh, I want friends, I want to be liked, to belong, to have a place in the world, a way to appear in public, a context. And all too often, I find the price of independent thinking too high, contrarianism too costly. So consequently, I, I have to confess, I have ended up pandering to all parties, trying to be all things to all people. So what's an example of this? Well, with my friends on on the left of um, the spectrum, I pose as a, a Remainer, someone you know uh, who's mortified by the EU referendum result in 2016. And I, when, when I'm with sort of people you know, further more to the left, the Remainers, or um, I'm a, I, I sort of feign being appalled by the xenophobes who won the referendum and are now doing their level best to ruin the country, closing Britain for business and forging a freshly antagonistic posture towards the world that will most certainly prove disastrous as we move forward to navigate the perilous waters of the 21st century. So that's what I'm like when I'm with Remainers. And when I'm in the States, I saunter the lawns of elite college campuses and peer down from ivory towers emitting grave murmurs of agreement to my liberal academic colleagues, devastated by the deplorables whose racism alone put Donald J. Trump in the White House for four years and want to do it again in 2024. But then I find myself with more conservative friends, swiveling around to ensure there's not a lefty in sight. I proceed with the self-transformation required to uh, up the chances of my acceptance. I, so I bemoan the co cosmopolitan disdain for faith, flag, and family, which in the end satisfy our need for roots. In the US, I curse when I'm in the US, the equivalent would be sort of cursing the coastal elites whose identity politics have ruptured the body politic and who eviscerate the very institutions of civil society they claim are the foundations of a healthy democratic life. And so thus play I, to quote Richard II, thus play I in one person, many people. And uh, whether it's Brexit or other issues, I feel pulled towards different tribes. I inhabit a self-induced schizoid reality and I expend a lot of energy trying to hide my hypocrisy. So resting free of package deals is difficult, but I think it's vital. The main message of this book is that a view cannot be right because it has been tacked onto another view for all manner of historical contingent reasons. What I try to do in the book is to, to extricate our thinking, particularly about moral issues, from our political identifications and instead to think through afresh according to first principles some of these issues. I attempt to sort of etch a sketch. Do you have etch a sketch in the US? Yeah. That means something that's, that's translating. Okay, good. <laughs> I don't want to leave you uh, in the in the dark. Um, with anyway, I wanted I, in the book. I try and attempt to sort of etch a sketch approach to ideology, picking and mixing principles from across the spectrum. In separate chapters, I take different values on the left, the values of inclusivity, sufficiency and reverence for nature, and on the right, family values, sanctity of life and personal responsibility. And I ask, what, what does it look like if we consistently apply these principles? 
and how does that cut across left and right? That's what the book's about, really. The task, I should say, is not to stake out some amiable middle ground or boring centrism, but instead consistently, as I say, to apply some of the left and right's most radical values. So let me give you an example of, from sort of both sides of the spectrum. On the 25th of March, 2013, Gail Gerlach, a 56 year old man from Idaho, left his vehicle idling in his driveway. It was 1997 Chevrolet Suburban, jammed full with his tools and supplies. Brendan Kaluza Graham, a 27 year old convicted car thief, must have thought it, that it was his lucky day. All he had to do was jump in, shut the door and drive off. But suddenly, just as he thought he got away with it, there was a crack and a bullet shot from 40 yards away, pierced the rear window and struck him in the back of the head. Kaluza Graham was killed instantly, the vehicle lurching on two blocks before careening into a garage. In court, Gerlach pleaded self-defense to a manslaughter charge because even though the car was driving in the opposite direction, he claimed to be, quote, in imminent danger of substantial bodily injury to himself. The jury found him innocent and reimbursed him for $220,000 of worth of legal bills. But the thing is, Gerlach is not only an outspoken gun advocate, Gerlach is a passionate anti-abortion activist as well. He belonged to the lobbying group Pro-Life Rocks, and in one Facebook post wrote, it is a human right to have life and no one's right to take it away at any stage. The irony of that statement seems to have been lost on him. Now, I realize talking about gun control being British, in some ways we sort of handed you this problem through, uh, you know, uh, for historic 18th century reasons I won't go into, um, not wanting to, uh, you know, ruin my wonderful welcome I received here in Boulder. Um, but so I realized that, you know, for, for a Brit to talk about gun control is, you know, dicey territory where angels fear to tread. But uh, there does seem to be a tension from an outside perspective about the, of, between the, the energy that the right expends fighting abortion and the amount of energy it expends fighting gun control, whether the extension of background checks or the prohibition of automatic weapons. Or take family values. Before I was at UBA, I actually worked for a, a think tank in, uh, do you call them think tanks in, in the yeah. US? You know, like Washington, it was in Westminster, lobbying organizations. So I worked for one called the Center for Social Justice, which was a bit of a raid on left-wing language for a sort of center-right think tank. Um, and uh, I, uh, at the time, you know, we were taking quite a lot of political heat for our view on family structure and our contention that marriage as the most, was the context most conducive for the flourishing of children. Now I happened to find that and found that and find that a compelling conviction. But faced with the fact that family breakdown in the UK is concentrated amongst the poorest, what we were also arguing as a think tank was that it was primarily behavioral factors, so a lack of commitment to marriage, which was the problem. But the more I engaged with the issue, the more it seemed that drawing this conclusion hid from view other major factors, ineliminably economic factors, that account for the situation of some of the most destitute families, families whose fates Robert Putnam traces brilliantly in his book, Kids. Why then, as a think tank, were we so reluctant to research the effect of scarcity on families working on low wages? Why were we so committed to the culture of poverty thesis and deaf to any arguments that the causal arrow might run the other way too? from poverty to family breakdown, as well as from family breakdown to poverty. And I sort of began to feel that the reason that we were 
you know, making these contentions about behavioral issues and the culture of poverty was because we had subscribed to a right wing package deal that we had in inherited views um, that, 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 was, that was straining um, what the, the case that, that didn't match on to the sort of reality that was out there. We could not countenance the reality of which Carl Pollyani wrote in The Great Transformation, the market's ability to inflict, quote, lethal injuries to the institutions in which social existence is embedded. Namely, he was thinking of, one of the things he was thinking of was the family. So the right's core principles, the sanctity of life or family values, we can be selectively applied, right? Not applied across the board. But subscribing to a left-wing package deal also lands you in trouble. Take sexual liberation, often held up as, while we're at it this evening, taking controversial views. Um, sexual, sexual liberation is often held up as one of the signal achievements of the countercultural left. Since the 60s, sexual liberation has given men and women permission and encouragement to pursue their desires free of inhibitions or strictures or pieties. And one result, arguably, is the sexual consumerism we have today. In a fascinating piece for uh, Vanity Fair, Nancy Jo Sales explored the phenomenon of, of Tinder. Um, she interviewed investment bankers in their 20s, drinking their beers and swiping their screens. And here's him, some of the things that they said. Alex said about why you should always be organizing multiple dates. You can't be stuck in one lane. There's always something better. And guys view everything as a competition. Who slept with the best, hottest girls? You could talk to two or three girls in a bar and pick the best one, or you could swipe a couple hundred people a day. The sample size is so much larger. While another guy, Dan, worst of all, wrote that Tinder is like ordering fast food, quote, except you're ordering a person. Now, what, what I'm interested in, this sexual consumer is, is a phenomenon, right? What I'm interested in, historically is the way that the most powerful critiques of material consumerism have also been found on the left. So social theorists attacked capitalism and our compulsion to consume. They identified consumerism with the cult of the transitory, whereby we swiftly exhaust our purchases, never satisfied with what we have, always restless and wanting more. So, you have this critique of material consumerism from the left, whilst you have arguably the, uh, not endorsement, but the unleashing of sexual consumerism due to a particular stance on the sexual revolution. And I think there's a real tension there. Um, the left's unwavering commitment to sexual liberation prevents it from taking on, from breaking with sexual consumerism prevents it from seeing that even if relationships are consensual, to order a person is to objectify them and prevents the left from seeing that our com that commitment to our relationships is what ultimately brings fulfillment to human beings. In the book, I say something here um, about what Kierkegaard called the aesthetic validity of marriage in either or. And he, he writes, this is Rivers, I don't know if, if you, if, you, if you know that, that passage or, um, uh, or uh, Kierkegaard's book, either or, but I would heartily recommend it. Um, and he, what he says has to do with the nature of repetition. With material objects, we sort of, uh, we, we uh, stop consumerism, we pull the brakes on consumerism by, by the fact that true appreciation of our goods involves foregoing immediacy and committing to a renewed contact with them. Similarly, with love, Kierkegaard says, only repetition, the experience of the same person afforded by relationships that endure over time, yields a fuller appreciation of his or her beauty. And he, Kierkegaard, employs this lovely metaphor for this. He says, it's like gazing at a stream in one regard, the stream is always the same, the same soft sound, the color of the riverbed beneath the current fishes that slide under the cover of the flowers. But in another way, he says, the stream is rich in change. 
So when you go back to it, it's the same stream, but it's also you're seeing the differences. Its appearance alters different aspects. Blanched in moonlight heat, for example, it looks different. In the same way, he says, marital love is dear to one who knows it, dear to him because he knows it. A constant return to the same partner in marriage might deliver delight, certainly, but Kierkegaard is hinting at something more than mere repetition. There is a greater delight which derives from love, quote, referring its experiences back to itself. Marital love builds upon itself. It doesn't start from scratch every time, but works off old memories to create new experiences. And there's, there's nothing sentimental about the aesthetic validity of marriage that Kierkegaard talks about. As with the appreciation of goods, relationships become a discipline, something we work at, and one that again requires limitation. Radicalizing this thought, true appreciation of one's partner requires forswearing all others. Making the most of this opportunity means actively foregoing other opportunities sexually. So marriage emerges for Kierkegaard as the aesthetic opposite of consumerism. Um, and uh, I find what he, what he says very compelling. Um, in conclusion, um, a lot of books about political tribalism that I read as, as researching, in, in researching this, this book, um, like uh, try political, I can't remember. Title, the title, but a lot of the books about tribalism say they conclude their books by calling for a ceasefire to the culture wars. And they say, let's leave these moral issues out of politics and agree to disagree. Now, there's clearly something right about that sentiment. We have to find ways to end the vitriol and the vilification, whether online or in person, the whole way in which public debate is conducted in so uncivil and unseemly a way, both in the UK and in the US. But the danger is that by agreeing to disagree, the solution that you get in these books on tribalism, on all the most important issues, we end up acquiescing in the status quo. What would have happened if the abolitionists or the suffragettes or the civil rights movement had just agreed to disagree? So there's what I call for in the book is this sort of um, is is looking at these issues, extricating them from the package deal, taking a view and defending it passionately, but with 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 this sort of ineradicable respect for the 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 other the um, dignity of one's opponent. Instead. I think we need people to think again. We need ourselves to think again for ourselves and allow our representatives eventually to adjust their offerings accordingly. Because fundamentally, I think there's something totalitarian about package deals. I find great, and because of that, I find great inspiration in the Czech dissident writer and then president, Vaktor Havel, who's in whose essay, The Power of the Powerless, writes, the primary breeding ground for what might be understood as an opposition in the post-totalitarian system is living in the truth. It is, he wrote, a drama originally played out in the theater of the spirit and the conscience of the society. I'll say that again. A drama originally played out in the theater of the spirit and the conscience of society. It begins with us as individuals and about the way that we think independently and for ourselves about some of these crux moral issues. Deciding then for us as individuals to live in the truth in Pavel's phrase, deciding where we stand on moral questions, irrespective of political parties, may not be the terminus because political and parties have value, but it's the right place to be in. Thank you so much for uh, coming out this evening and listening. Thank you. So we'll take uh, questions both from the audience and also I'll keep an eye on, uh, for those of you who are attending via Zoom, you can, again, just to uh, uh, restate uh, Dan's uh, remarks at the beginning, 
in the Q&A function, you can you can put a question and I'll try to alternate between the two. But yeah, uh, Dan, you wanna take sure. it away? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm loath to ask a, a critical question to someone who is against tribalism and quotes hobble. Uh, <laughs> but let me let me Good. let me press this um, a yeah, little please. more than I actually believe. No, do do for this. Um, I wonder if consistency is as great a virtue intellectually as you suggest. Yeah. So, um, with your package deals, for instance, um, it strikes me that one could make an argument against gun control against gun, the sort of gun control measures that um, are put forward in the US. Um, an argument perhaps that, um, I mean, a, a self-defense based argument, an argument that, that uh, contrasts, recognizes the costs of, um, of how things are here, that wonders whether gun control measures would alleviate, how many of those costs, how much of that cost, mm -hmm. gun control measures would actually alleviate, but also looks across, looks at England, and sees a, a situation in which someone could break into your home and terrorize you, and if you and you can't you can't protect your property um, without mm. running foul of the law. Say, yeah. Um, and at the same time, um, be uh, be against um, against abortion and say any circumstances. Yeah. Offenses. Now label it pro life. And it looks like there's a big tension here and point to a case like yours. And admittedly, there's, cer there's certainly uh, an inconsistency. I mean, it seems like this wasn't remotely a, a case of self-defense yeah. from your, from yeah. your description. Um, uh, and, and the bumper sticker or whatever, or, whatever, or Facebook post or whatever yeah. it is that you, that you quoted uh, is, is uh, Quite in a posit for someone who shoots someone stealing stealing his car and driving, driving away, certainly. Um, but I wonder. I mean, the thing about the thing about analogies and consistency pressure is that you can always there are a lot of there are a lot of disanalogies here. Um, and if you had, if the case had been different, you know, then one could one who was in that position would say, well, the thing about abortion is that it could be innocent, right? And, right. Whereas the home in invader changing the case on you yeah. is not innocent, and therefore, you know, well, that's the right to say to say whatever. I wonder if a better way of approaching, um, of criticizing tribalism is, is 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 maybe just asking asking people if there's something that they disagree with about the tribe that they are mm -hmm. in, because that that question I think I think can be revelatory. When people when people are very hard pressed to come up with anything that they disagree with about yeah their and it looks more like faith doesn't it yeah yeah well, that's good. yeah good question do you know that is it the Emerson quote about consistency is the whole goblin of little minds I know the quote of course yeah but I, I yeah I quote that in the book yeah and so I think um, I mean as I said I I I think in the general and then I'll talk about more particularly in the gun control case. Um, you know that it isn't just for the sake of consistency it's for the sake that our chances of of getting it wrong on issues sort of goes up um as we allow the ourselves to be guided by the historically contingent um coalescing of views that happen into package deals and so it isn't it isn't just you know because things are inconsistent it's because like it can lead to us being off right so in the specific case of the of gun control and, and abortion clearly that is the disanalogy is uh is would be a question around guilt and innocence and um the innocence of the new one which is my my term in my first book for uh the fetus of the unborn child um which i hope was less ideologically freighted but uh the the innocence is under, is, in, is undisputed, I, 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 unless you can have cases where, like Francis Cam will write about, or Jesus Jarvis Thompson, cases where um, you can have uh, 
unintentional threats, right, to the life of the mother, um, if the if the child you know is um, if the physical life of the mother is in danger, the child sort of even though he's not in, in, you work it through double effects, so it isn't intent it's not an intention of the child obviously but it can still be sort of seen as a threat and therefore you could get some sort of consistency to the to the gun case if you look at those cases but they're so rare that in the normal case of things you're right that innocence is in question but the reason that was the reason that i sort of say like it's not it's just the amount of energy that's expended that's how i, I put it in those terms on um on, on on gun rights for sport and the way that America is such seems to be such an outlier internationally in terms of uh, gun deaths um, to you know non failed states um, seems it seems like the 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 the, the problem or the, or the to be inconsistent in terms of the amount of energy that you're expending trying to to save lives. On the abortion front, saving lives on the forty thousand gun deaths a year front, um, it just seems to be that the inconsistency there does that is does prove glaring in terms of it doesn't seem like the counterfactual of how many lives are saved um, through self defence measures in the home compared to say something like in the UK where we don't have like our crime rates in terms of um, you know. So people charging into people's houses aren't like drastically greater than in the US. And so it seems like something does seem off there and that the inconsistency is sort of spotlighting that or training of searchlights on that. Um, did you want to come back on that or do you want to ask another, another question? Go, go to another question. And then maybe maybe I'll join in the queue. Okay, you. great. Thank you for your question. Yes, please. Uh, lady, oh, you sorry, you're doing it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry, yeah. So someone on Zoom asked, have you come across groups, uh, US especially, but also UK, who are crossing the tribal barriers, breaking uh, the packages up to become across sort of package breakers, so to speak? Yeah. Uh, and if so, any sense of what's behind that? Is it sort of economic interests aligning primarily or, or something else? Yeah, that you see that's a good question, that? yeah. I mean, there was there was an article by uh, I think it's Leo Labresco Sargent in the New York Times um, about eighteen months ago um, about um, certain kinds of Catholics who I would say are package breakers and cut across. Um, so with sort of um, with in terms of their political economy, uh, have the resources through Catholic social teaching to criticize some of. Um, the excesses of a market fundamentalism, but then would be socially conservative when it comes to uh, questions of abortion or assisted suicide. Um, and so I think, and there, so their faith, which I didn't really talk about in the talk, but you know, we obviously have package deals in the churches in the UK and in the US as well. Um, so it's interesting how faith though can also cut across these packages. So that was one group that comes to mind that was um, that was uh, identified in this piece in yeah. the New York Times. So would you say, just to follow up on that, is it that they have wider kind of forms of belonging and just the, the political tribe and the cult? I mean, would you say that's mm, a kind of... Thrall to a, well, it's a so either to a church or yeah. a common humanity or something like that? Well, in the, well, yeah, the, ref, the, the sort of Anglican in me wants to say that they're enthralled to a foreign power, uh, but that's just snide. Um, but, but there's good things about being enthralled to a foreign power, I'm talking about the Vatican. Um, and uh, in terms of, uh, there is that broader um, intellectual tradition in Catholicism, I think, which informs that the um, independent mindedness. Now, maybe I'll preempt one question, which is to say, in my book, I don't sort of just suspend belief. I do come down and say what I think about some of these ethical issues. And so one thing that's been said in criticism is, just to give you an easier job criticizing me, is that uh, uh, you're going to always end up with a package because you're going to end up having views on different subjects. And so it isn't necessarily the fact that 
that you know I, this book kind of represents a package of positions um and uh but it's just how that we how we come to form those packages which is which is you know it's it's what is it rn talked about the death of thought or thoughtlessness you know that's really what i'm what i'm going after but the yeah, lady there on in the oh, yeah, uh, in the mask but that doesn't really <laughs> narrow it down <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. And that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see options where where I could enjoy the menu more. Um, uh, in the UK, there've been these these movements like Blue Labour and Red Tory. Have you ever heard of those? Um, and so Morris Glassman, who's a, a Labour lord, but was the, the only Brexit. Uh, he didn't vote because he's an House of Lords, but it, Brexit supporting Labour Lord and uh, is very much informed. He, he's a secular Jew, but he's informed. He, he talks about Catholic social teaching as a gift uh, to the tradition of, and he's all about trying to put the social back into socialism as, as he talks about it. But, uh, you know, there are, there are different, and so the, the Blue Labour story in the UK has been actually how it's influenced some of the conservative um, positions on, on, on wages and the way that wages have been affected by Brexit. And um, uh, I'm not an economist, so I'm not on, I'm not on, uh, I'm on so slightly shaky ground when, when it comes to, although I do have a chapter on political economy here, which I would recommend heartily to you. Uh, however, um, so there are these different movements to try and shape the Conservative Party in Britain into something that the Red Wall offering, i.e. Uh, to, to constituencies north of the country, outside of the London elite, um, which is very interesting. Um, and uh, the difference between a somewhere and an anywhere, I don't know if you've heard that language from David Goodhart in the UK, which is quite interesting, which is sort of cuts across left and right as well. Um, so, you know, in this country, I mean, that's why I ended with the harbour on sort of it begins with sort of how we ourselves as individuals think about these different issues and then want to sort of, you know, eventually in 10, 20 years time have parties that will reflect, um, that will re reflect different conglomerations of views. That would be the dream. I don't know in a, in a US context because I haven't lived here for four years, um, you know, if that's, if, that's a, if that's a possibility. And, you know, it's obviously going to be very interesting to see in the Republican Party, uh, who is put forward um, in 2024, and what sort of the candidate that, that looks like? So, yeah, did you? Want to, uh, oh, sorry, you're you're no, yeah, taking your job. Yeah. Just to go back to the other side of the point, um, like you said, obviously, we're economists, but it's interesting to me that you Yeah, it's a very good question. Online, yeah. Yeah. Um, what's your name? Chris. Chris. Chris was asking, um, basically, uh, because there are such high costs to contrarianism, or not contrarianism, but independent thinking, and why in social settings um, there are such advantages to um, the way we recognize each other, because we can, um, 
you know, I, subscribe to a package deal and not be made to feel in, embarrassed by that. Um, you know, is is there a way out of this problem? Am I, am I doing justice to your question? Yeah. Okay, good. This is a test, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <goodness. laughs> um, and uh, I think, you know, it comes down to, edu you know, education becomes, you know, very important at that stage, doesn't it? There's the way that we're educated and the way that uh, we're, we're, we're sort of, we're taught to think um, and the way we're taught how to think about how to act and how to think about how to think about how to act. Um, and, you know, um, we haven't, I haven't really discussed in my talk, um, you know, race and uh, Black Lives Matter phenomenon, which has been, um, you know, hugely influential in the UK as well, um, you know, since, since the murder of George Floyd. Um, and, uh, um, but we're seeing in the UK, you know, uh, and I know that the, in Virginia, which is the state that I'm particularly keeping interest in, the Glenn Youngkin's victory was, off, you know, in terms of, uh, was, was very much talking about education and the rights of parents to, uh, um, to, to shape or to have some say in what their children are taught. So I just note that, not because I don't want to come down on a particular view there, but um, but just to say how education is really up for grabs, because the ideal would be, and Marilyn Robinson writes on this very interestingly, that education and liberal arts education particularly allow us to question our premises to, as you say, um, you know, ask what are the things that, where have we moved recently in terms of our intellectual thinking? Where have we changed? What are the things that we find frustrating about the positions that, which positions we find strained, which, are, which coalesce around some of the other positions that we feel com find compelling, you know, the a liberal arts education and the traditions that that we that we um, are, ta are taught through and the sort of texts, you know, I think they do start to illuminate the historic the his historical study. Of those positions starts to illuminate the historical contingency of things, like the fact that you know it was the it was FDR Democrats Catholics who were um, pro-life, you know, in, in, in the 1930s and the 1940s. And I'd write about that in a chapter of the book on the sanctity of life, how, how they were obviously, you know, changed and captured by the Republican Party. But um, yeah, so I think, so it's, I think what you're saying is an argument for um, classically liberal education in the sense of liberal as in, um, an education that allows for a range of views. And sometimes I worry about, um, in the UK context at least, uh, particularly views that are, um, uh, are excised from the public square because they're seen as being unacceptable. And there's a loss of, there's been, I think, a loss of free speech in the UK context. Um, and that, I think that is vital, that, that having an education that, where views are entertained, that are allowed to be aired, is vital for getting at this package deal passion or problem. So but thank you for that question. James, I'll I'm take a uh, real quickly question from Zoom and then we'll go over to Bob. Um, actually, I'm going to give you two questions here. Okay. The first is, what is the great question? I think that sounds kind of alternative, but like, what's the big question we face today, I guess, is how I'm interpreting that. Yeah. And then uh, the second one is, where does truth fit in? So what's the great question, where does truth fit in? And I know we need two separate things here, but uh, those are pretty terse uh, questions. Yeah. There, so I, I thought it could be both. Yeah. Well, you know, I think living in the truth, as Havel writes about, um, is about thinking through some of these ethical issues on their own terms individually, as I've said. Mm -hmm. um, and I think finding values, these, these six different values that I look at in the different chapters of the book, um, I think that they align with the good, that, they're, that they are compelling principles um, and that um, they partake or participate in truthfulness, um, in truth, however you, uh, you want to sort of say that. And so um, those, those particular principles is, is how I try and frame it in the book. In terms of what the great question is, um, yeah, I mean, I'm looking at a wealth of questions in, in this in this particular um, in this particular book. I am particularly interested in a written on in another book. Um, I think one of the great questions, not maybe not the great question, is is the way that um, 
uh, we've we've come to to see reproduction in a different way, um, and so we've come to see procreation as a reproduction, and uh, uh, and we we sort of the language. I remember when I was teaching bioethics at, at UVA, trying to sort of brush up on some of my uh, uh, biology, and I went and sort of looked at this uh, textbook and. The, the new one is described in the textbook as the product of conception. And I was sort of interested that in this language of reproduction, product of conception, that there's an objectifying of the new one, of, of, the, of the unborn child, um, which, which, uh, which sort of is a great question of how that's happened and what the effect of that objectification is, and what the consequences of that are, I think is a huge civilizational question. And, uh, I think that, um, you, um, yeah, that's what I want to say about that. But I think that's a great question. Yeah, Bob. Uh, it's hard to follow up on those last two questions that we're just kind of you know, cut right to the things that matter most. But this is at least a medium important question, maybe. Uh, you, you said some things about why people are drawn to get themselves in a package and stay there. But it's another question to ask. Who makes the packages? Why are the packages what they are? And, and, and you said you don't think there's a rational basis why they have to be the way they are. And um, you suggested you don't think it's religion that's driving the packages. Um, and it doesn't seem like it could just be facts about human nature, given that you said there's historical contingencies and you mentioned that different nations, they work differently. So I'm just wondering, do you have a story about who makes the packages? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... I do in the set, in the different chapters. I tell the different stories of how the positions have come to be reached on the different issues. Um, you know, I think um, you know, like how pro life became to be associated in, with the Republican um, platform, and so I'm sort of um, pointing point to that. But but it's but the, the the sort of yeah, I was just lost my train of thought. So, sorry, you were asking about who makes the packages yeah yeah and um and and how it, and how it is that we've arrived at this place today of um yeah i mean i you know i think you know one one thing is obviously this is a question about the power of political parties and uh and so it's the nature of an adversarial political system um which is something that we find attractive for lots of reasons. This is one of the negative effects of that in some ways. Could, you could see my analysis is pointing towards, towards that sort of story. Um, uh, and so, you know, I've been questioned by, um, by some, some folks about, you know, what do you think, what sort of vision for um, a, a political party? But I, uh, um, so I think that, you know, that, I think that's one one part of the answer, but I appreciate the question. Yeah, thank you. There is a question just about this issue of tribes. Uh, uh, why do people continue to talk about people being tribes when obviously there are interest groups with diverse beliefs? So I guess this person sort of questioning the tribal kind of language. Maybe yeah. just we, we sort of collect in interest groups. Um, yeah, yeah. well, if you look at something like intersectionality, you're having in different interest groups being unified into maybe something into more something more tribal. And so it's the relationship between different uneasy relationships between different interest groups um, that is interesting. I mean, what what's also interesting to me is is when there are um, when interest groups uh, collide. And we've seen that in the UK at the moment with uh, um, with trans exclusionary uh, radical feminists and free speech and social conservatives sort of teaming up um, against to sort of um, against groups that would see trans rights as as being the next frontier of of civil rights, and so it's it's, in, it's sort of there are these unlikely alliances that happen between. Um, between social conservatives, classical liberals on free speech, and radical feminists who feel that the uh, the trans um, movement is threatening 
um, uh, is, is unnaming women, to use Helen Joyce's language in that book, trans. And so I'm interested in, to the question in how those interest groups do, do when, they, when they do press against each other, I feel like truth's more in the offing because um, or when on, on a, you know, disability activists who are otherwise pro-choice are pro-life when it comes to the um, uh, abortion based on the grounds of disability would sort of unite those interest groups would unite with social conservatives who are against abortion so i think when those sort of alliances happen or when those tensions happen i think those are interesting sites of contestation um so there was one other thing i want to say in answer yeah, to uh, what was your name sorry well um i know i was thinking when you were speaking is do you know Jonathan Haidt's work, The mm. Righteous Mind? Yeah. So he would have a story, which I sort of have different views of that book. Um, I don't really like the Humean account of rationality in it, but that's a sort of different question. But in terms of thinking about uh, evolutionary taste buds and how there's a wider palette for the conservative, I think there's quite an interesting story about holiness and sanctity. Mm. Although I have heard critiques that, you know, the left liberals also have moments of holiness and sanctity, but they're just expressed over different issues. But I don't know if that's something that you uh, you think sort of provides a, a story about the sort of rise of some of these. That, that's more about the rise of tribalism in general than than about these particular amalgams of views that are the package deals. Yeah. Yeah. To follow up on that, James. Um... I mean, it seems like, you know, when we talk about left and right, there are certain tendencies of what we might call progressivism and conservatism that are, you know, I mean, I think to follow on the Jonathan Haidt point are in some ways rooted in human nature. So, you know, insofar as, you know, we think things are problematic or bad, we want to change, we want change, right? And so Obama runs on change, right? And so insofar as we, we like things the way, you know, there's good things we're attached to and that we love and care about, we want to hold on to. Uh, we're, we're conservative, you know. Um, so it seems like there are maybe some aspects, like, I mean, do you see some maybe ways, I mean, so I think you're right, some of these principles, like, I'm, you know, I'm for equality, and, you know, that could be cashed out in any number of ways, or, um, and so it doesn't seem like it has to always be a package deal, but there's some, you know, beyond just kind of historical. There's some logic to that. Some logic yeah. to, like, um, a left-wing position or to a right-wing position. Now, again, they, there's complexity there and there's different kinds of left and different kinds of right. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think um, the certain kind of ways of ordering values or the ways you're oriented towards the world. Mm. Uh, I mean, do you see some of that? I mean, that, that there's some logic behind it. It's not just sort of- Yeah, I'm trying to think about that. Yeah. I mean, Tristan would be interested in your view on this in terms of uh, conservatism. Um, <laughs> I have friends on the right who've sort of given me a hard time for exactly those sort of reasons that want yeah. to see more of coherence because I'm focusing on matters of, of incoherence, I, I suppose. Um, so, um, yeah. So I, I need to think probably a bit longer about that question. Thanks for flooring me from the chair. <laughs> You're not allowed to do that. You're supposed to be aiding the enterprise. <laughs> There, there's uh, someone uh, asked, are these package deals as common and or robust in the UK and other democracies with multiple parties? Do you think ranked choice voting is the runoff to mitigate the lockstep packaging comment offered by the parties? What's ranked choice voting? Um, would be one, two, three. Uh, rather than first past the post. Yeah, exactly. Right, okay. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, um, I don't know enough about um, some of the European nations that have more, more, uh, you know, more parties. I mean, we've had in the UK since the coalition government of 2010 to 2015, we've had the sort of demise of the, the Lib Dems. And mm -hmm. so that sort of increased sort of the, two, the two party, even though we have a Green MP in Brighton and so forth. Um, but I think that, uh, so I think we have some of the similar issues um, in the States in terms of the party system. Um, but, uh, but 
but um, what was the first part? The first part of the question was. Um, so yeah, the first part is, do you see these like package deals, are they as common and robust? They're different. Different, okay. Yeah, but, but they are robust and particularly around Brexit. It's sort of like if you can predict someone's view on Brexit, you can predict their view on all kinds of other issues that have nothing to do with Brexit um, and, um, and on COVID too you know i mean i wrote at the beginning a piece which looks for the hedgehog review that, that probably looks very naive now about everyone coming together in solidarity and alone together and you know everything around the and how this is the moment that we sort of break polarization and you know quite a charming piece <laughs> <laughs> but, but it looks a little naive now um but uh um yeah so so yeah 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 yeah. yeah, so this is kind of following up on some stuff that both me. It's about what are the problem is with um, having two packages or limited, not very coherent packages versus just having strong tribal um, affiliation. So say for um, whatever reason, we managed to switch to a system where there are say 12 tribes and they may be um, match, uh, ma ma are more coherent, whatever your personality or sacred values, you're, it's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be um, maybe a, a, be a better, most people will be able to find a better fit and, you know, um, and, and maybe that might depolarize things. Some I might be a three, but I can get along well with one through six and I only hate the 11s and 12s. Yeah. Um, would that, um, it, if you end up with more internal coherence, and, um, would that be enough? Especially because you're also getting the advantages that have always been mentioned. It's like hard to figure out all these issues um, for yourself. Like in Colorado, where we get all these things on the ballot, and I have to think about what I think about um, policies for dealing with the homeless and easements on golf courses and all, all sorts of things. And it's a, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So at, at that point, like once we've got enough tribes and they're, you know, maybe more coherent and identify their principles better, is the problem solved? Or part of what you're saying seems to think there's just a problem with having too much of an attachment to the tribe or too defining your allegiance too much in terms of that that mm -hmm. might remain even if I got a fairly coherent tribe. Mm -hmm. So yeah, would, would 12 tribes solve the, the, the problem question, yeah. and then, then yeah. they're all better? Or um, like right now, the finding is the people who don't, don't buy in packages tend to be less politically engaged and just yeah. are not into it at all. Yeah, because is, is, is the solution to move away from any, any yeah. sort of strong identity or package? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're right. So, because I'm not calling for political apathy yeah. <laughs> in the book, um, the, or the, the agreeing to disagree, or, you know, so how do you have, um, yeah, how, how, how do you have strong political, because engagement, um, whilst having the, having views on some of these issues which cohere, hear better yeah i don't know i don't know i mean i think you know increasing the increasing the optionality for people and that being represented democratically um has got to be an advantage i don't know if it would solve the problem but uh yeah yeah so that at least sounds like a better world where there are 12 yeah. packages you can choose from yeah uh but there might still be some some of the problems. Here. Yeah, yeah, I think so. What do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, I I think that would solve a lot of the worries about coherence while getting a lot of the because I do see a lot of benefits in not having to think through everything from first principles for yourself. For you have to outsource, yeah. Yeah, but then I do worry, especially the more those. Um, if the more those pack packages are associated with um, certain socioeconomic cultural clusterings, and then you you only like those people and you don't connect with others, then I worry that like a lot of those problems would still remain. So if tribalism like helps tribes, you to be like, across having two tribes on twelve helps more groups to identify across 
Yeah, it might help a little, but if the groups turn out to be very strongly clustered geographically or economically, mm -hmm. then it might get worse because now Increase people like, really so. hate yeah. the people who are very different from you. Yeah. And when you only have two, when you only have two groups, you've got to include a lot of both rich and Just, not rich and educated yeah. and not educated yeah. in a way that you so might you, want you to. create a whole other set of problems. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Thanks. Uh, just kind of building on that. So it seems like the problem with having salt tribes is that you have social fragmentation and there's nothing to unify around. Right? Um, now, I had a question about what, what you think we can unify around. It sounded like you wanted to say we're unifying around a kind of joint aim or joint enterprise, which is the truth, the pursuit of the truth or living in truth. No? Yeah, I think so. This, this is not too idealistic. And, and the basis for that is our dignity. I think the, the basis, yeah, the basis for for that is going to be um, different reasons for different for different yeah. principles. And I'm just I'm wondering whether the, the the joint enterprise or this joint pursuit of the truth, whether it depends on being members of the same community or or, or it depends on any kind of social identities, or is it a purely sort of you and I are rational deeds and we're joint yeah. pursuing the truth? That seems to that seems to be a divide between the left and the right, where the right thinks that needs to be a you know, member of the same community and borders matter and so on. Other people say, as long as we're rational human beings, we're engaged in this kind of joint enterprise. That tends to be more kind of left. Do you think so? Because yeah. but then but then you have what's the tribalism of the left based on? Do you not see that you the right things? Yeah. Well, it's the tribalism of many, I suppose. Many maybe it's the intersectionality of like hmm. many tribes on the one. But, yeah. Um, it seems, I know that divide seems to matter to me, or it seems to make a difference because we could have a lot of debates about what it means to pursue the truth, and that seems to be, that seems to break down along tribal lines as much as anything does. Tristan, could just add, yeah. can, can you say that tribalism there is like the non cosmopolitans? It's not like cosmopolitanism overcomes all divides, it act, you know, it's, it opposes itself to those you know, people who are. You know the the, the uh, somewhere people. That's a <laughs> yeah. It uh, seems to be roughly that distinction. I think you know whether it's a tribe of place or it's a tribe of ideas mm -hmm. in some sense. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's really interesting. I don't know what I can intelligently add. I'm starting to run out of material. I can just start banging my book on the table. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, whether whether having been through certain experiences together um, allows certain positions to come into view uh, so that there is more of a connection to, to who we are um, because of the particular stories of different nations. Um, and uh, so something is more historically mediated than just a sort of bloodless, or rationality, but I, the sort of reasoning I'm talking about, I, I sort of hesitate to allow it to be characterized as the sort of moral reasoning I'm calling for in the book as disengaged, bloodless rationality of a causing kind of whatever, you know. So, um, yeah, so I'm slightly hesitant about allowing the cognitive part of the, what I'm calling for to be characterized as more left. In that way, that's why it's living in truth, right? That's yeah, thinking in truth. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Did you want to follow up further? Yeah. Sure. Um, so I was interested in in um, discussing the merits of the uh, gun restriction and the abortion restriction mm -hmm. uh, questions. Um, then in um, noting something, this is some of, I don't know if this is a follow-up or if it's like, Perfect, like yeah. Stuff, in any case, here's a, here's a similarity that strikes me between um, uh, anti-gun control and anti-abortion restriction activists. Mm -hmm. um, I think both are driven by, to an extreme position by this very same argument. The argument is a slippery slope, and they're not wrong. That is to say, uh, people who are against all forms of gun control aren't wrong to think that their opponents aren't going to be satisfied with, with small measures. Mm -hmm. But 
Um, but to give an inch on this is to um, it, it is to go in a direction that's going to lead to um, you know, to the gun grabbers taking away all your guns. And when people are quite explicit about that being the thing that they're trying to get to, yeah. it's not paranoid to think that. Yeah. Similar, there are restrictions on abortion that seem so so easily defended, at least to, to me, that that it seems to me that by far the most charitable view of the majority of people who are against practically at not any in this country I mean, restriction on abortion is that they see quite correctly that restrictions on late term abortions aren't going to are going to satisfy some people but they're not going to satisfy most of the people who are anti-abortion because they're going to they're going to push for a, a very restrictive one. yeah because um, once you get 12 weeks it's like arbitrary and then why not right yeah, yeah. Right. Right. So, it, it, so in, in in both in both cases, it seems to me that that people are you know except for there there are crazies on on both sides. I mean, there is the you know celebrate abortion crowd, which mm -hmm. um, these are up here at least. I don't know if there is there is in England. But there, yeah, yeah, there, there is. Too, yeah. There really is, and um, and because of the milieu in which I travel, I hear those people more. But if I lived somewhere else, then I would get more of another another view that is. Certainly, out there in the U.S., where um, it's not just defending yourself so much; it's go ahead, sort of a go ahead, make make my day. Um, if I'm quoting yeah. these two correctly, yeah. Here, where 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 the thought is something like the world the world is a better place when I've killed someone who has tried to uh, endanger me or take my my truck. Or, yeah. Or, or, or there's a sort of celebration and there's a form of similarity but, there as well so, yeah. so here's a so here's a suggestion the suggestion is there's actually a pretty good slippery slope argument on, on on both sides yeah and then what there is because due to this tribalism is group polarization and that's the that's the underlying human tendency that's going on here when when I have to when when when, when we get together and we fight any restriction on whichever side whichever Issue this is, yeah, um, and 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 um, the the opposition by looking at, at you know the genuine goals of, of, of some of them. Um, then we we end up just talking amongst ourselves, and then the charisma of the more extreme position wins out, and you get you, and you get um, dirty Harry on one side and celebrate your abortion on, on, mm -hmm. on, on the other. Mm -hmm. now, I don't know if this is a question. Yeah, it's a very interesting <laughs> comment. No, no. It's, and so you're seeing the sort of the similarity. I see. A, I see a huge similarity between the kind of extremism about abortion that, and the kind of extremism about, about yeah. gun control. Yeah. Arguments. Yeah, I think I see that. Too. And I don't even see yeah. them as being as being um, uh, the similarity as being so ill placed. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, I I don't have anything to add to that. But I, I think it's a, yeah, an insight I'll take care of my suitcase and think about some more. So we have, uh, we're trying to wrap up at uh, 7.15. Okay. And I'll, I'll just uh, maybe give one last question here. Uh, okay, great. So this is from online. Is one risk of tribes or package deals that they eventually lead to disillusionment with the practicalities of governance? Were the inconsistencies in a tribe's belief, or would that the inconsistencies of a tribe's belief become uh, evident. Um, given that tribalism is useful to certain power structures, how do we convince people to move positively away from the desire to be in a tribe? There's a few of the parentheticals that just keep it short there. I mean, there, there's a couple different aspects, but if you want to just pick up on any of those in the yeah. one to two minutes we have remaining. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I suppose part of that was sort of speaking to what I was saying about, you know, coming to sort of appreciate the ineradicable dignity and humanity of the other person mm -hmm. both uh both in who we are arguing against but in terms of the tribe and so try to die dialogue is, is a kind of liberal answer in a way a classically liberal answer to tribalism is to sort of think about the sorts of dialogues we want to have mm -hmm. um i think that would be sort of where i point in terms of yeah. answer to that question yeah, yeah.
Sounds great. Well, uh, we will uh, end it there. If you will join me and thank you, James, for a great talk and a great conversation here. And thanks again to everyone coming out, uh, both in Zoom land and in person. Uh, join me now. Thank you, James. Thanks, James. <laughs>